This is a book review of Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon, and it was published in 1973. I picked it up because I saw that it was listed as one of the um, 20th century's best novels, and I thought, goodness, I need to read that one. And that's all the information I had going into it. <coughs> Since, um, I had a friend and I said, hey, let's let's uh, read it together, do what I call the book club. It's a book club of two. Because I thought I would need someone to hold me accountable to finish. She agreed. She said she'd tried to read it before but had not finished. And uh, now both of us finished and we discussed it yesterday. And um, in a restaurant. And I told the waiter, we're in a book club and neither of us like this book. But more discussion happened, and um, I've come to an appreciation of the book for sure. It won the National Book Award for its year. Wow, big deal. And it had a special place in the history of the Pulitzer Prize. It had the... Um, it had the place of not winning the Pulitzer Prize, but occupying the space that would have been filled by the Pulitzer Prize so that no other book could occupy it. The reason the Pulitzer Prize committee did not award it the prize was because it was gross. There was sexual fecal play going on in this story and they couldn't deal with it. It was gross. I remember that scene. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was why until later when I did some research on it. I'm like, oh yeah, even reading it, you know, I'm like, okay. This book is anti-hero for sure. If I had any interest in this, I could go into like a historical review of what books were anti-heroes because that's a certainly a genre don't like anti-hero hmm it is dystopian it is sci-fi it is dystopian as sci-fi often is and it is hopeless there are dystopian books that are not hopeless this is the hopeless kind and it is a post-modernist masterpiece recognized by many people and myself now, having engaged with it, read it, and engaged with it, um, it does, to me, feel like the next in the line right after Ulysses by James Joyce. Ulysses by James Joyce was a modernist masterpiece. This one is the postmodernist. Mm. It has much bigger scope than Ulysses. It's similar to me. My reading buddy did not see the similarities. I definitely saw it from the very beginning. It, and of course, when I read it, it was like the matrix. I'm like, oh yeah, all the people in this are cogs in the machine. The themes of paranoia, identity, physicality, like we are animals and very much the intellectual, the guy is trying to explore, um, the mind, the working of the mind and the psyche. There were dozens, maybe hundreds. Uh, yeah, I think I think somebody said, um, I heard somebody say there were 500 characters. I don't doubt it. There were an enormous amount of characters in this book. However, I could not find a single character in the book that was acting on his or her own impulses. Talk about dystopian. Talk about postmodern. So I termed a word. This is my word for, for after reading this book. Avolution. Nope, I said that wrong. Avolition. There was no will. There was no desire to action. There was no aspiration. And it was the opposite of aspiration throughout the whole book. And in the postmodernist world that this book shows, before any of the characters were able to make choices, all the possibilities were pre-selected 
by institutional, non-personal systems. I wrote this one down, right? Before any of the characters were able to make choices, all possibilities were already selected by institutions who were not personal in any way. Even the most primal forces of the primal choices of reflexive, reflexive, like a reflex, Ooh, like, you know, an instinct, a reflex, a reflex. The sexual desire was manipulated by impersonal and uncaring institutional forces. The intention of those institutions, why were these institutions forcing themselves in this, in this world? Not for the benefit of the individual. The individual was irrelevant for anything but experimental observation and the individual had potential use like a cog in a machine. It was a hell of a book. It was really long, right? And desires, aspirations, and love in all these hundreds of characters was at best an unnecessary side effect of their existence. Their purpose was not benefited by desires, aspirations, or love. And therefore, any of those experiences, feelings, were as unnecessary and embarrassing as a fart. And I can bring up fart because so much of the story was extremely primally basic. It was so sophisticated, it was the opposite of sophisticated. Did I talk about it enough? I'm almost, you know, I'm seven minutes into this video and I haven't even talked about the characters at all. Ha. Okay. Let's talk about the plot and the characters, some of them, a little bit. It's such a big book that I can't talk about all of them. But the main character, Tyrone Slothrop, he's an American lieutenant. Oh, it's set in World War II. It's set in World War II and most of the action takes place in Europe. So he's an American lieutenant working in the United Kingdom for allied intelligence. So this is already weird. He's already dissociated from his place because he's not in America. He's in the UK working for allied intelligence. And he is under observation by allied intelligence because there's a connection between his erections and V2 rocket bombs, their explosions, bombings. Okay, this is the boyest book I've ever read. It is incredibly masculine, hyper-masculine, and so therefore it was really hard to read. Ugh. All right, so the, the premise of the book is that there is this, and the driving force for what happens in the books, in the book, is uh, that he, there's an effect between his erections, sexual activity, because those aren't always the same thing, right? But they don't really differentiate the two here. There's a um, connection between when he has sex with an erection and bombs fall. He notices this trend. He's like, this is weird. There's this woman. Now, this being World War II, he's having lots of sex, comparatively, um, with different women. Um, and so he's noticing, okay, I had sex there, and I had sex there, and a bomb happened close by each time. Every time. Okay, remember how I said it was a very masculine book? I'm like... Oh my God. I thought this was some kind of masculine fascination that the story would get past. It kind of starts off very early with like, he's like, yeah, I'm mapping this out. I'm like, that is so, you know, dude to be very, <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, whatever. Let's get past this and get to the real story. Right. I've kept reading, thinking this stupid part would pass. Really? This is a sci-fi fantasy book about when 
the man ejaculates, a real bomb goes off. Okay. Aggrandizement much? Uh, All right, fine. But then it didn't go away. It turns out that was the whole story. I'm like, oh my God, what am I in for? This is the greatest book of the 20th century, according to this book, according to this list. Wow. Okay. So what's the story? How is this good? Lieutenant Tyrone Slothrop, and his name is kind of an anagram for entropy. You mix those up, entropy, because that's the tendency to devolve into chaos. There's no order here. There is at best patterns that don't come from the people. But he's trying to figure out what happened. And in the start, he notices this pattern and he goes, am I paranoid? Am I just, this is, this has got to be a coincidence, right? How else could this, he, he must be paranoid. However, it becomes clear to him that he's under observation by his employer because of this. So he is kind of a lab rat and they're observing him for this connection and power that he has. So not only is he not irrationally paranoid, he's not paranoid enough. This boy book, this masculine book, actually many people think it is really funny. It does have comedy in it. For the right sense of humor, a lot of people would find this laugh out loud funny. It is absurd and ridiculous in many parts. Not my kind of humor. It's kind of a gross sex, fart joke, silly, limericky kind of humor. Wasn't really funny to me, but I could see that it was trying to be funny. So I'm like, okay, he put in that effort for the funny. I saw it was there, but it didn't really make me laugh. None of the characters were likable to me. They were really pitiable. I felt sorry for them. I hoped that they would get to a better situation. All of them. None of them were in a great spot. All right. But here comes Slothrop. He's come to this understanding that he is oddly connected to his very basic primalness. His emissions are connected to these huge bombs. So in the heroic tradition, he leaves and goes on a journey, the hero's journey. He goes on this foggy quest and it's not, it's not purposeful exactly, but he just kind of is pushing in sort of this blind worm kind of way to see what this connection is about. So he travels, his travels and his adventures, once again, remind me of James Joyce's Ulysses. Ulysses was walking around all in Dublin for a day and having different, not Ulysses, um, Bloom was walking around for the most part. And it was very um, rooted. Ulysses was very rooted in the physical reality of Dublin. Gravity's rainbow is not rooted in physical reality at all. It's got some overlap, kind of. Um... Now, that reminds me a bit of Catch-22, which is kind of similar, that um, Catch-22 has got like fictional places. And so I'm pretty sure these fictional, these fictional locations that are story after horrifying story after crazy story of what is going on in um, Gravity's Rainbow. So Slothrop is pushed and pulled through this landscape, meeting people and exploring more of his questions. He's trying to figure it out. But so many crazy things happen. And it sort of fits because it's war. War allows for a suspension of the ordinary, for sure. So it helps. But then again, you know, none of it makes sense. So he's exploring it and and he begins to focus in, he and the plot focus in on a very specific V2 rocket, one that has the serial number, that it's the first rocket. It's the first one. 
So he's moving through, and this is a special one that's held in reserve. Okay, so this becomes clear as all these things are going on. Okay. Now, as I said, there's a lot of different stories going on, and paranoia is definitely a theme. Identity is a theme, too. Who is he? What is this? Now, it's kind of messed up. It turns out that Slothrop's father sold him to a psychologist for experimentation or sold the use of his infant self for the use of experimentation on how erections happen. And this psychologist, this is one who was baby, right? The psychologist ended up going back to Germany and was involved somehow in the creation of the rockets. But the psychologist, according to the theories proposed in the book, didn't turn off this erection. Apparently he could create this erection for studies. I'm like, oh, that is so messed up. That is just ridiculously messed up. It's painfully messed up that a psychologist would be sexually manipulating an infant. But this is like sort of the origin story of this connection, right? Like, is this really a thing? And kind of the sci-fi reason. Oh my gosh. All right. So he's trying to explore and learn about who he is. I don't, I think much of the story is not necessarily revealed to him, but we find out through being the readers in this um, story. Okay. He has identity. Now he does know who he is, at least his, his body and his mind, he knows who he is, but he changes clothes. He changes uniforms. Sometimes he, he, he loses his clothes some way. And then he has to wear the uniform of an English person. He has to wear the uniform of a German person. He wears this costume that looks like a cast off stuff that, that people call him a rocket man. And then he's a Russian officer. And then he also finds a costume that is a pig. So all of these different changes make other people see him in a certain way as his clothing. He knows who he is and he will correct them, but they don't care. It's his clothes that matter. So he does at least retain a sense of identity internally, not in the world. Some people know who he is and they push him into different costumes. And in fact, the pig costume As he's at this party that includes the pig costume, somebody else ends up wearing the pig costume. And therefore, these political actors get a hold of the other guy, thinking it's Slothrop, identity, and perform on this guy, mistakenly thinking he is Slothrop, a castration. Ugh. A castration in order to affect something to do with the bombs. His identity is stretched and pulled in so many different ways. And other people act upon this misinformation of his identity based on the clothes that he has to wear. It's very backwards. Instead of trying to affect the bombs by stopping them from being launched, or stopping a war. They castrate this guy under this half-baked belief that his erections has something to do with the bomb. So there is a lot of, you know, gross boy sex. The sexual scenes in this book are very perverse. They're, I guess some of them are vanilla, kind of. Um, but they are very graphic. And there's like so many of them. So much sex is going on in this book. That's why it didn't win. It, it got the National Book Award, but the Pulitzer Prize is like, ooh, ooh, we can't, it's gross. Ooh, poop. So they couldn't do it. Which played exactly into the themes of the book, 
that institutions were so absurd. They, the institution of the Pulitzer Prize annihilated itself in appreciation of this black hole of a book. Their whole existence of awarding an award for a novel was sucked into this black hole so that they annihilated themselves for that year in appreciation of the power of this book. Oh my God. This book's, this book has layers upon layers of very important themes that can be explored. I don't even have the wherewithal to go too deep. I can't. We'd be here forever. <laughs> Me and my friend, uh, when we were having dinner discussing it, I said, you and I are the only the three people, the three women in the United States who have read this book this year in the 21st century. And she said, who's the other woman? I said, I don't know, but there can't be more than one. This is a very masculine book. And I've read lots of masculine books. I've read lots of hard books. Here's the thing. This book does not have any male characteristics or characters that I admire. These were not likable guys. These men were reprehensible. I mean, not even strongly reprehensible for the most part. They had no desire. They had no aspiration. They had no heroism. The best that Slothrop could muster was curiosity. What a world. The curiosity was the best you could do to express your individuality. Wow. All the characters in this book are acted upon like the Pulitzer Prize Committee. They're acted upon, not actors. Even the actions they do, like, you know, walking down the street or having sex, are mostly facilitating the institution's broader manipulation and control of themselves and others. So when different people inside the military positions that they held were doing actions they were acting against their own self their own potential interests in order to continue to help the institution manipulate themselves only not just themselves more broadly manipulate lots of people very very destructive. There's no soul. Oh my gosh. All right. However, as soul denying as this story is, it's very, very relevant. The world is even more that way now than it was then in 1973. It's even more that way. We are more depersonal. Thomas Pynchon was prescient in his description of this world. Like the Matrix, the individual is reduced to consumable material. It's more true than ever. The idea of sexual, of the individual's sexual impulses being controlled and tracked by non-personal institutions is as relevant to today as the watch on my wrist. It's as timely as the second hand. It's happening. The individual is 
not even just repressed, actively manipulated. And so, this is a masterpiece. It's horror. And it's real. It's definitely, I can agree, as much as I didn't like it, I'm glad I read it. And I could talk about it forever. Love to know what you think.